Greetings to everyone and thank you for joining this Tuesday webinar brought to you by the Franchise Talk, organized by Index Conferences and Exhibitions. My name is Troy Franklin and I'm the CEO of World Franchise Associates. And I'm joined by uh, Fee Von Yun and Harish Babla. Um, and we're going to uh, spend an hour with you today talking to you about, about franchise, the current franchise scenario in Asia and circumstances relating to, to the current pandemic and opportunities as we uh, quickly emerge from the pandemic this year and into 20, 2021. So uh, let me thank you all for, for joining us uh, from wherever you may be and, um, and to uh, let you all know that, um, that uh, we appreciate your time today. We understand that uh, we're living in a unique and and uh, challenging time. I think that no one is uh, in the world is uh, immune to the current situation. Um, I know I'm an optimist and uh, I know my two co-presenters who are longtime friends are also optimists and that uh, for us, the glass is, uh, is uh, half full, always half full, never half empty. And uh, and so we're going to be putting a very positive spin and talking about the positive elements of the of the situation and the way forward. Uh, but we do want to say to anyone whose who's loved ones who has been affected or anyone whose loved ones have been affected by this terrible pandemic, we want to uh, to recognize um, that this is a difficult situation and to, to send you our condolences um, and uh, wish anyone that's unwell a speedy recovery. Um, so on that note, I'm going to start by by spending 15 minutes um, giving you an an overview of uh, of the franchise situation with the pandemic in Asia, and talk about some opportunities um, for Asian brands looking to enter into the Middle East, the GCC. I'll then hand it over to uh, to Fee, who will introduce uh, digitalizing franchise models during the pandemic. And then we'll move on to Harish, who will talk about a case study of how his brand, Pure Nectar, adopted to uh, COVID-19 and has continued to expand globally. Um, at the end of the, uh, the discussion, we'll have 15 minutes for questions and questions in as we're talking. And then we'll prioritize the questions based on relevance. And, and at the, uh, for the last 15 minutes, I'll read out your questions. And will uh, one of the three of us on the panel will answer your questions um, at that point. So on that note, I'm going to share my screen and start my my presentation. So my topic is franchise during and beyond the COVID-19 pandemic. And just a bit about my myself and my company. Um, I'm a shareholder and director in World Franchise Associates. Uh, we're a leading franchise, global franchise, marketing and advisory company uh, based in London. Um, and we're owned and operated by, by franchise experts. Collectively, we have a couple of hundred years in uh, international franchise experience. And we offer international franchise marketing and sales programs uh, to brands. Uh, we, we run franchise, different types of franchise development programs. Uh, we, we, we run franchise investor advisory programs, and we also do work for governments, um, government and institutional programs. Um, my background, I'm an American, but have spent the last 35 years living in different countries around the world. I've uh, been involved in international franchising for more than 30 years. Uh, my experience is working for both franchisors and master franchisees across the different sectors of F&B retail services. I've traveled and worked in more than 70 countries. Um, and since 2014, I've been a partner and director in World Franchise Associates. Also quite uh, have spoken and uh, been involved in quite a few um, franchise expos and events and, and enjoy sharing my the knowledge and experience I've accumulated over the last uh, 30 over years with uh, with others in our industry. And you'll find from Fee and uh, Harish when they introduce themselves that they're also 
longtime franchise industry expert with experts with uh, years of experience across multiple markets. Um, one of our platforms, which may be of interest to you if you're looking to acquire a franchise, is the World Franchise Center, www.worldfranchisecenter.com. Uh, more than 200 brands featured from 30 countries. And I'll just show you a portfolio of a few brands that are looking for partners in the Middle East and uh, Asia Pacific regions. Um, some of these brands, you'll see the logos are from uh, multiple you know, countries and all seeking partners in the international um, uh, environment. And again, these brands, some major brands from, from big markets and, uh, and some successful brands from Asia, the Middle East, uh, Europe, Africa, South America, et cetera. So let's uh, get into the to the details of the presentation. So 2020, from an Asian perspective, is known as the year of the rat, based on the Chinese zodiac, and and the lunar new year follows a, a, a solar calendar and fell on the 25th January. And by all accounts, the there was a, a, a high amount of optimism heading into this this year, uh, but of course, in uh, in February and March. Um, you know, word got out that there was a virus that was expanding and there was fear about what would happen in Asia. And very quickly that became a global spread to Europe and on to the US and became a, and uh, South America became a global pandemic. And uh, what was the uh, year of the, of the rat has turned into the year of the mask, unfortunately. And uh, I think I won't speak to you about the profound impact that this has had because we're all living on the same planet in the same circumstances. And I don't think anyone who's joined us is immune to the to the circumstances. Um, prior to COVID, there were some really positive franchise trends in uh, in the global franchise uh, arena. And uh, just to, to give you some of those trends, international expansion, there were more more brands were growing outside of their home market than inside their home market. Um, I think the U.S. for every three units open, two were outside of America. One was inside, um, which is phenomenal. And um, in franchising is in more than 200 countries on every continent, and uh, and there are more than 100 franchise associations around the world. Um, another trend was emerging markets. More and more franchisors and brand owners are looking at emerging markets. Um, there's a, been a growing demand for specialized services, things that are that are unique and different that aren't food. Um, growth of health and fitness and wellness franchises has been a been a uh, emerging trend in in franchising. Another trend is the growth of children's focused franchises. And another is the rise of mobile franchises. A few more trends. Uh, technology, you know, the, the importance of embracing technology as a franchise brand and using the cheaper, more efficient uh, technology that's av available to us um, today uh, through uh, digital platforms, th through the cloud, um, is becoming more and more important. important. Um, we're seeing a bigger demand for casual and premium fast casual restaurants, um, primarily due to lifestyles, but also because the quick service or fast food segment has become saturated because it's been around much longer. Uh, healthy menu options has become a big trend. Harsh, we'll, we'll talk to you a bit more about that later. Uh, Non-traditional fran franchise entrants, such as hotels and hospitality businesses, as an example. Uh, social conscious, socially conscious franchises, and uh, another big trend is cloud or ghost or host kitchen franchises. So about the pandemic, I won't read these one by one, but but there's no shortage of institutions and and publications that have crystallized the impact of the uh, pandemic, such as the London School of Economics, Har Harvard Business Review, Time Magazine, uh, the United Nations Development Program, and some of the reading is really quite fascinating. And uh, and more specific to our industry, um, this is a graph that shows you just in the Asia Pacific region from 1963 to 2020 what's happened with the 
economic uh, downturns over the years and and you can see the Asian financial crisis and the global financial crisis, which happened in 1997 and 2008, respectively, um, the pandemic stands to have a bigger impact on the economy in uh, in this region than these these two crises um, crisis have had. And uh, and you can see the 2021 estimated bounce back. There's expected to be a fairly significant bounce back. So let's talk about how the pandemic has specifically impacted franchises. And to do that, I'll explain to you that a successful franchise brand is built on some very fundamental uh, foundations, and that's a profitable business model, competitive market position, and committed ownership and leadership. And, and if a franchise has a combination of these three things, then it does have the platform to, to start to grow and become successful. And the reality is the pandemic has shaken the platform or shaken some of these brands because it's impacted their sales and profitability in their home markets. And because they're dealing with the challenges in their home markets, it's become more difficult for them to deal with their international family and their network. Um, you know, they're fighting fires at home. And as a result of that, a lot of these brands have cut overheads, uh, retrenched people, and some of their key international people have have left the organization, meaning that that the brands are not operating with their strongest people in the international um, arena. So these are some of the downsides to the uh, to the pandemic on our industry. Um, very few franchises have been immune to this. Um, any brick and mortar business operating in a country where there's a lockdown would have been would have been impacted quite badly. Uh, we're seeing that the lockdowns are easing across many countries, um, which is a blessing. Fine dining and fine casual restaurants, bars, cafes that don't have a strong delivery or value, value element have suffered uh, because of social distancing and the impacts on lifestyle. Uh, global travel restrictions have hurt brands that are, that are dependent on travel and tourism. Uh, they're among the hardest hit. And of course, the economic impact of the pandemic has impacted consumer confidence and spending, which affects business and industry on a whole. So let's move away from the negative and, and move to the positive now. So while many businesses have been negatively impacted, there are in fact some businesses that have have benefited or 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 thrived in the pandemic. Uh, or continue to do so, such as essential service categories, um, you know, franchises at uh, convenience stores um, that offer uh, uh, pharmacies, that offer uh, things that people need regardless of the circumstances. Uh, I know cleaning and disinfecting franchises have done well. Uh, F&B brands with a strong delivery element like pizza have actually seen sales increases in some countries. Uh, fashion and other retailers with strong online platforms have done well. Uh, retailers that have uh, have uh, promoted their products on on la the Lazadas and the Shopees and those type of platforms, the Amazon platforms, and of course I mentioned earlier delivery and strong value proposition brands. Uh, when times are tough, people look for value. There's also brands that have have not been built to thrive in a pandemic, but who have acted quickly um, to to adapt. I mean, fitness brands very quickly started offering online classes, um, and this could be the new norm in some cases. Education and children's education franchises have done the same, and we see retail brands developing more and more online platforms, and F&B brands launching more different and different types of delivery options. And the truth is that, in general, franchise businesses are weathering the pandemic better than independent business operators due to a variety of factors, including the quality and experience of their leadership, their economies of scale, uh, the brand awareness, and the brand loyalty that the brand has. So being a part of a franchise network in a situation like this does provide some strength in numbers and some comfort. A post-COVID outlook. Um, What's it going to look like when this is all over? The million dollar question is, is when? The answer to that is going to be different from, from country to country and region to region. Um, Southeast Asia is seeing many countries pull away from COVID and move 
to recovery. I believe that's happening in Dubai and other GCC and, and Middle East countries as well. And views do differ uh, depending on who, on who you ask. And, uh, and obviously a vaccine would change the game dramatically and we're all hoping and praying for a vaccine. Um, broadly, franchising is expected to pick up where it left off. So those trends that I mentioned at the beginning of my pr presentation are expected to become or to continue after the pandemic and after COVID is behind us. And, and we believe that franchising is going to recover quickly and, and become a potential investment avenue for many people looking for opportunities post, post pandemic. I think it was Benjamin Franklin, one of the founding fathers of my, my home country, the United States, that said out of adversity comes opportunity. And, uh, and I believe very strongly in that and many, many uh, situations or many businesses are built and strengthened by, by challenges um, as our relationships. But um, I want to share a quote from uh, Babette Masur Wood. She is the, uh, the foremost franchise expert and the head of the franchise division of Denton's, which is, by, which is the largest law firm in the world by number of lawyers. And she was recently quoted as saying, franchising is the ideal strategy for growth post-COVID. It offers an asset light expansion option to franchisors whilst giving franchisees cheap access to substantial know-how and industry expertise. Compare the average franchise signing fee to the cost of paying a consultancy to help you develop a new business model, franchising wins easily. So this is, uh, this is very refreshing and interesting to read by, by one of the world's leading franchise experts. There's reasons that you look at for expanding internationally, expanding franchises internationally or acquiring uh, international franchises, and, and those won't change due to COVID. Um, and, and in fact, are more important or will become more important, we believe. Uh, franchising provides a brand with new and diversified income, income sources. It reduces uh, dependence on growth in uh, single home markets. It provides a hedge against economic downturns in home markets. It's a way to leverage, leverage your existing intellectual property. Uh, it allows you to go into less saturated and less uh, competitive markets. And it, for franchise uh, brand owners, it provides added value uh, for the, not only the brand owners, but the other stakeholders, suppliers, employees, uh, other franchisees, et cetera. So these reasons to expand internationally are going to come back uh, stronger than ever uh, in 2021 as we as we leave this uh, COVID pandemic behind. Some things that are going to change, some wisdoms um, that are going to change post-COVID. Uh, beyond four walls, uh, delivery used to be a nice to have, it's going to become a have to have in, uh, in, the, in the new normal. Uh, Localization or the need to be flexible on a on a market by market basis is going to become more of a priority. Um, liquidity is going to be more valued because you'll need the liquidity, or people will be more worried about risk given their learnings from this situation, and they'll want to make sure they have stronger foundations. Uh, having stronger foundations involves being more careful with your due diligence. Um, Businesses and brands are going to look at the quality of the people. Um, you know, they're going to want people that can help them get through difficult times. I can tell you there's going to be some really, really good people out there looking for work in the, uh, in the right now and into the coming year. And anyone looking for franchise experts and uh, franchise expertise, it's going to be a, a buyer's market. Who would have ever thought that that an act of God or force majeure would become such a big issue, but but it's a major issue between franchisors and franchisees now because no one ever predicted such a such a pandemic, and we believe that this is going to make a lot of the franchise lawyers a lot of money modifying franchise agreements to plan for something like this in the future. And again, technology. If you don't embrace technology uh, in the franchise sector. Uh, you'll be left behind. It's an absolute must to continue to be competitive and maintain a strong position in, your, in the marketplace. 
So that's my presentation. I, I hope I didn't go too fast, but we're trying to cover as much as we can in a limited period of time. And on that note, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Fivan Yun. Um, as I said, a, a dear friend and a uh, and a, a fantastic uh, franchise expert, franchise author, uh, franchise leader, um, Vietnam's most most uh, knowledgeable and capable capable franchise expert, and and also across Southeast Asia, one of the leading. A franchise expert. So over to you, Fee. Thank you. Unmute, Fee. Please. Hi everyone. Sorry, there was a bit of a technical issue. Thank you, Troy, and hi everyone. Um, my name is Vivan. You can call me Fi. Um, just a bit about myself. I uh, used to be uh, working for Troy. <laughs> he used to be my big boss. Uh, used to bully me a bit, but uh, it's okay. <laughs> we can take it. Um, so I spent about um, 15 years, I think, uh, traveling the world, developing franchises um, for um, a big corporation from Australia. And uh, uh, recently, uh, I have changed my career. I'm now uh, the chairwoman of Vietnam Angel Network. So um, basically, I'm an angel investor um, into um, franchise and retail startups um, and um, also run um, a, an accelerator called Friend A, which is a global franchise accelerator program um, to help startups to be able to um, scale globally through franchising and licensing. So that's a bit about myself. And uh, am I positive about the pandemic? Obviously, I'm going to share with you my stories, true stories of how myself and my teams have been fighting the pandemic in the past eight months. Um, the positive news is um, within six, seven months of um, 2020, I have actually invested into four different uh, startups, uh, all of them from Vietnam. Um, but that tells you that um, you know the, the market is there, the, the models are very adaptive to the pandemic. That's why um, even though um, you know uh, globally is a is a global um, economic crisis, I'm still um, investing. Um, secondly, um, I have been working very hard um, hand in hand with all of the teams um, to actually digitalize their franchise model so that they can withstand the pandemic and now be able to um, use their digitalized franchise model to scale um, nationally and internationally. So that's the, that's the story behind what um, I'm going to share with you today. And I think, first of all, when comes January, when the pandemic started in China, um, we thought, OK, you know, we need to survive. So we're going to make a few changes, uh, a few tricks here and there to be able to, um, you know, maintain some revenue and sustain the business until the pandemic is over. Well, not long after that, we, we learned that the pandemic is not going to go away very soon. So. Um, you know, all these little changes, small changes that we made to the business models won't really um, help us to, to be able to grow um, eventually. So we have to think about transformation as in changing this whole franchise model and business models around so that we can, you know, not only grow within the pandemic uh, period, but also grow beyond that um, globally. So how do we do that? First of all, um, I have 19 companies in my portfolio, right? So um, about 50% of those are very much traditional franchise models. So it's very physical stores um, uh, that you need to go to to be able to uh, buy products or services. Um, during the pandemic, the first thing that we have to do is to uh, turn that traditional franchise model into flexible offline to online models. Um, so we don't we don't have a choice because you know of the um, social distancing because um, 
you know, some sometimes we have lockdown, we can't go out, so people can't really go to you um, to, to be able to buy products and services. So we have to um, create opportunities for us to go to the customers. Um, and so uh, a lot of our franchise models have been transformed from traditional franchise um, brick and mortar mo brick and mortar models into flexible online to offline models. And secondly, during the pandemic, um, I have to say that cash is king. You have to keep your cash and you need to, um, to be, you know, uh, very much aware about the risk. So a lot of people don't want to spend too much money into CapEx, into, into investment. Um, and uh, we have to start thinking, so uh, how do we then break down the different investment packages? And how do we change the models into modular models? So people can actually invest into a basic model first. And then as they are confident with the basic model and actually get revenue, they can upgrade their model as they go. Um, that's the second thing that we actually <clears throat> did during the pandemic. Um, the third is um, digitally enabled. And you know, we all know that um, we're all talking about digitalization um, and we have been talking about it too much, uh, but the pandemic uh, didn't give us any time to delay or any opportunity to actually think twice. We just have to do it. So we started um, introducing or integrating a lot of the marketing automation, um, management automation, um, um, HR and e-learning uh, into um, our business model so that, you know, we can work um, from home and we can still operate uh, given um, the, the difficulties of social distancing. Uh, number four is customer experience driven because we're all moving online. So it's quite difficult. Um, for us to actually create um, what people normally say the supreme uh, customer experience. Um, how do you do that when you move your business online and everything is about a click or an enter or, you know, um, a tag. Um, so we have to sit down and re re rethink and redefine what customer experience means to us. I'm going to show you some examples later on. Um, and then number five is um, we have to change super fast. So when the pandemic started, um, I remember I have 19 different group chats with, with 19 different companies and teams. And we basically talk like every five minutes and every 10 minutes and everything that we need to do to change uh, needs to happen within the day. There's no tomorrow, you know, that kind of fighting spirit. Um, and we work around the time, around the hour, um, just to make things happen because we know that we don't have time to to delay. So those are the few um, the few things that me, myself, and my team we have been working so hard um, during the pandemic to um, help the businesses to be sustainable and to be able to grow in the future. I'm going to show you some examples um, of the uh, models that I work on. This is pre-COVID. So pre-COVID in Vietnam, very much food and beverage. Um, brands, um, very much brick and mortar, uh, very much non-digitalized. These are the next generation of franchisors that are so hot in Vietnam at the moment. Um, and um, these are some of the examples. I, those are all the, the brands that are in my portfolio at the moment. Um, run by very young entrepreneurs, um, uh, very tech-driven entrepreneurs as well. Um, so I'm going to show you the models. This is one of my pride at the moment. Um, I invested into this company uh, in February when they had two, uh, two fitness studios using EMS technology from, from Germany. And they were both very much um, brick and mortar studio, fitness studios. You know, um, right now, after five months, we have seven already. We're opening two per month as we speak. Um, and uh, we turn it into an O2O EMS fitness studio model. So basically what it means is number one, um, you have an app so you can book um, the, the time slots anytime you want at anywhere, any location you want, including your home. So you basically have the choice of you know doing your workout at home 
and we package the, the equipment and the PT um, trainer to be able to deliver um, a training session at home for you if you if you want to do that. Um, and secondly, um, you have you know customers have access to different packages that they want in terms of services. They can choose to only do the work at one studio. They can buy a package that gives them access to all the studios. Um, they can choose the access to in-home only. They can choose the access to everything plus in-home. So we give um, customers a lot of choices um, for them to be able to, um, to, to use the service and everything is digitalized. In terms of management, um, you know, my, I have Slack um, on my phone here, and um, basically I can manage the whole business from afar. <clears throat> we have marketing automation, so everything from Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, um, Hotline, everything, all the data goes to HubSpot, which is a CRM system. And we know every every customer that you know touches us um, at on any online platforms or offline platforms. <clears throat> that way, even though we work from home, we know everything that's going on. Um, at the same time, franchise wise, um, everybody who has franchise inquiries also go to our CRM. So every day I open it up and I know how many people made inquiries, what kind of status. Is, um, they are during the franchise process, um, whether there are notes that our team needs to share with each other, um, everything is online. So I basically sit at home and uh, manage the business together with the founders. Um, this is another example of a uh, star, star, uh, spa, sorry, spa franchise. Uh, I invested in this uh, company Two and a half years ago, it was a totally brick and mortar um, uh, spa franchise. And during the pandemic, nobody can go to spa, right? So what we do was we create a platform, uh, not only for spa service, but also for uh, cosmetics, natural products, and also health and wellness products. Um, so it turns into an e-commerce, mostly like an e-commerce app, a super app. Um, again, you can you can choose to um, book service um, at home and we will deliver the service in home for you. Uh, you can buy any products that are health and wellness related. Um, and uh, we use our, um, our service team to actually deliver all the products to you. So that's another example of how a brick and mortar traditional franchise has been turned into now a super app franchise in the health and wellness sector. Um, this is uh, a vegetarian restaurant we started last year. We have two um, restaurants right now. And um, what happens is um, people can't actually go to us. So now we, we're turning it into a cloud kitchen. Um, it's still vegetarian, but you can order uh, what you want. You can order per week, you can order per month subscription, um, or you can um, order for your events or your family dinner. So it's uh, from a brick and mortar. Uh, a model, it's now turned into a cloud model. Um, this is an interesting concept. Um, so, you know, to, to, to actually have a tailored service, you have to get, you get people to measure you. And, you know, there's a lot of um, activities involved into making a suit or making uh, some clothes. But for us, um, we build a platform with 3D scanner with blockchain. So, uh, blockchain technology. So basically, um, you only need one person to basically use a scanner to scan yourself and get all your measurements. And um, the order goes straight from, from anywhere in the world to our production facility in Hoi An, Vietnam. It's going to be made and it's going to be sent out. Um, so the whole thing is totally um, technological um, and digital. And the only customer experience touch is the person who delivers or who takes orders um, for all of our services or all of, all of our business models that I just mentioned. Um, we basically train the ambassador who goes to offer the service, who goes to deliver the service or the products 
and create the custom experience there at the only human touch that we have um, within the whole supply chain. This is an interesting um, concept. Um, I invested into this company only early this year, and uh, they basically are a hardcore technology company. Um, they do AI uh, consulting. They um, build AI virtual characters, um, and they have a super a great AI chatbot platform, which is used by about 10,000 um, SMEs in Vietnam already. And so when I looked at this, I was like, okay, the same business model can now be replicated anywhere because technological platform is there. So even when you sit in Dubai or Qatar or wherever, um, you can actually log on and use the user system. Um, you, the only thing you need to do is, is provide a service to whoever the SMEs or the companies are um, to help them to build um, the AI chatbot for their companies, uh, especially during the pandemic when everyone is now turning into digital. So we're licensing this platform at the moment um, as a new concept. So as you can see, everything that I just share with you are true stories that we have been working on and building on. Um, and everything is digital, everything is about digital transformation, everything is about moving online, but at the same time trying to keep the uh, offline component intact, um, trying to, to, to focus on a custom experience wherever we can. And basically um, all of the um, franchise models are uh, built on um, the same philosophy, very uh, low investment and high return. Thank you so much. And I think I'm moving on. I'm going to introduce my um, my old friend uh, Harish Bapla from Punekta, and uh, he's a, he's an excellent speaker. I always enjoy um, his um, speeches anywhere in the world, and um, I think he's going to share um, with you um, his learnings from uh, from his brand um, during the pandemic as well. Thank you so much, Harish. Thank you, Fee. Appreciate it. That's my presentation up. Okay. Good evening. And uh, thank you, Troy. Thank you, Fee, for the introductions. Uh, I, uh, I bring a different angle. I think uh, what Fee and Troy have said is so valid uh, in today's world and after uh, 30 plus years in uh, franchising uh, it uh, it's interesting to see how everyone is adapting to the challenges taking place i want to approach it from uh, the standpoint of uh, our experience with the brand and uh, how our mindset was uh, as we looked at this uh, pandemic so at the end of uh, january uh, I was actually in Phuket, Thailand, uh, enjoying the beach and without a single worry of COVID. Now, that is not to say that I had not heard it, but it was not taken seriously as most people around the world were doing. And there I met someone in Thailand that I had known who, who all of a sudden with great seriousness started talking about the concerns of COVID they had in Phuket because they get so many tourists. And that's when my antennas went up for the first time to say, maybe it is time to pay a little bit more attention because being in Singapore, we had not heard too much about the concern of this. Now come, come to March and uh, in March, we had a whole different uh, lifestyle that took place for most of us. And it was in the lockdown, whether it was people learning how to cook at home, teaching children how to cook, whether it was people making masks, people standing in their balconies, uh, trying to talk to their neighbors from far or singing to their neighbors, whatever it was, we had really had to transform around the world. Uh, this busy lifestyle became uh, very much constrained, right? And uh, so except for the few businesses that perhaps uh, were essential that continued uh, going on. Then we come fast forward a little bit to June 
And what, uh, because uh, us human beings uh, certainly do not like to be uh, tied down. And by June, I think uh, world leaders started recognizing that locking down countries and economies uh, was quite devastating because it impacted people uh, in terms of their uh, jobs, uh, in terms of uh, going crazy in the house, spending more time uh, with their families uh, than they had previously. Uh, and so we we discovered a new kind of freedom uh, called a one meter apart, and face masks became part of this uh, freedom. Now, so let me, uh, I'm, I'm with Pure Nectar, and Pure Nectar is a cold press and fresh juice uh, business. Uh, and I'm going to, in a little while, I'll give you the details of the model, but in essence, we are an essential business because it is all healthy products. And as Troy mentioned in the beginning, healthy products are needed today. And Fee, I was so pleased to see Fee had a vegetarian concept also, uh, because this is today's customers are demanding uh, healthy uh, products. And in our case, we had built a model that was multi-channel already from the beginning. So we had a wholesale component where uh, our products were kept at distribution points. Uh, and then we had a retail model where customers ordered online and the products were delivered. Now, what we didn't have was retail stores in this equation that were owned by our franchisees. So we have a, a unique business model with a most, with the essential product and multi-channel uh, approach. So let me, I wanna just touch on three markets and give you how the experiences of our franchisees and their ability to adapt uh, in this environment. So let's start with Manila, which is our longest uh, uh, operating uh, franchise. And there, the, there was a heavy emphasis on retail outlets that gave the orders to our juicery. And 85% of the business was coming through that way, and 15% was online. Now, when the lockdown happened in the Philippines, it was quite severe. In fact, the lockdown st even today still exists to some degree in the Philippines. And overnight, through fast adaption of the business, the business turned around and went 85% online and 15% dependent on the retail location. Now, of course, the retail locations haven't produced yet, right? But it, basically 85% of the revenues were converted to an online business rapidly. I, I would say within 40, 45 days, the business was able to adapt and recover. Now with it came some challenges also because uh, due to the lockdown, transportation uh, hubs and delivery became a big issue. Employees could not come into the uh, facility where the juice was made for delivery. So there was a heavy reliance on uh, uh, Uber and Grab type of deliveries to deliver uh, to the customers, okay? But the good news was that in a very fast manner, the business converted to an online because the platform was already there to do it and I would say that it's actually more profitable because a lot of the retail overhead has disappeared, okay? Now then we go to a, uh, a different market, which is a very small market. It only has about 400,000 people, uh, and it is uh, the uh, island of uh, Brunei. Uh, and uh, whereas uh, here, the, uh, our franchisee, because of the smallness of the market, uh, had gone more to a our distribution points were in big demand, right? And because people like to not be stuck and they will just, the delivery systems are not there. And so as a result of that, uh, the people like to go to stores to pick up the product, right? Now, when that disappeared, it, the impact was tremendous because now the people had, the consumers had to adapt to ordering online. And that was something that they had not uh, been used to. So the impact and the struggle and that market actually still remains because people, uh, the consumers have not adapted. While our business is ready for this online, it is the consumers in this market that have not uh, adopted yet. So we hope that they will soon enough. So let's talk about Singapore. In the Singapore market, uh, it is a very interesting story uh, because it was really a positive impact similar to Manila, but with some different elements that came into play. 
So the online business increased five times within 30 days. Uh, and But more importantly, uh, I mentioned something called cloud kitchens and dark kitchens. So in Southeast Asia, there's a company called uh, Grab that has these hubs, and the hubs actually started keeping our product and delivering the products to the customers within 30 minutes. So aside from our own delivery platforms, the consumers were actually getting our products through this cloud kitchen format where they keep our products, uh, and we just top up their uh, supplies on a daily basis. Uh, and as a result of that, that business uh, opened our eyes to this whole uh, food delivery part of the business became a a bigger part of the uh, business. So what we see with these three markets, the lessons that we have learned is that really speaking, you need all of the above, okay? I, I am of the belief that if you, customers are going to buy differently. And you will see in a minute, I will talk about the consumer mindset. And because of that, we cannot just go one directional. So previously many concepts uh, were focused on brick and mortar, right? And they suffered because they couldn't adapt. Similarly, I don't believe you can go completely digital. You need to have all of the above in, in place because it is really at the end of the day is how does the consumer want to buy your products? And I think the, having the options there is extremely important. Okay. So let's uh, talk a little bit more about this experience. And when I, when I talk about the experience, I want to actually first answer uh, some questions first, okay? And I think these are questions that we probably, all of us uh, that have been stuck at home in one way or another have, are, are thinking that, you know, people talk about this new normal, right? So what does that really mean? What is this new normal? Is it something that is going to really be there or are we creatures of habit and sooner or later we're going to revert back to our old ways? Okay, so that's as a, as a business, we have to ask that question that are we dealing with a temporary issue or is it something that is actually, this new normal has become long-term? And then the second question I have I ask is how long is it going to take to whatever this new normal is? Is it the new normal, the old normal modified slightly or is it really a new, new mo normal? And how long will it take because there is, all this, in different countries, you hear different things. Some people say, you know, if we have therapeutics, uh, we will be okay because we know how to deal with the disease. Uh, some say we have to wait for a vaccine. Uh, you know, but when you look at the flu, uh, only 30% of the people in Western countries actually take the flu vaccine. So are people really going to take this vaccine or is this a, a, a fear-driven thought process that we are going through, right? So. It, I think these are valid questions of, is it uh, this year? Is it going to be next year? Is it 18 months? When is it that we get back to this new normal? Then look at these changes that we are taking place. And really, I, I really believe that we are creatures of habit. And while some of us, that we are comfortable with some things, we will adapt and continue. But if we can really revert back to our old ways, we have a tendency to do that. Okay, uh, and this is why, you know, the, uh, there are so many diets that take place, uh, and every January there are new diets that people start because, uh, you know, by January 15th, people have reverted back to their old habits of eating, right? And, and so as a result of that, I think we have to be, uh, we have to look at it and say, is the changes we're making to the business that we don't go so far that it then comes to hurt us because people really wanted some of the old things in there. Uh, and then fourthly, the question becomes is, are we ready to face the world with opportunities and optimism, or are we going to be driven and governed by fear, right? Uh, because at the end of the day, it is that glass half full, glass half empty thought process that we are looking at, right? And, and, and I think a lot of the answers to these four questions are driven by your own uh, mindset of how you look at the world. There will be some people that are so afraid of all of this that they will never, even though they engage with a franchisor and they look at the business model and they say, this is great, they'll be afraid to take the step, okay? And it has nothing to do with the economics. It has nothing to do with where the lockdown is. 
It is just in their mind. And you cannot change that because that's your own perception of the world and your own fears. And there'll be others that look at this and say, this is fantastic. This is an opportunity that I can go establish. It'll take a, a few months to open the business anyway. And by that time, I will be ready uh, to go, right? So again, I think these questions have relevance to each and every one of us. So from our standpoint, and, and my personal standpoint, we are very bullish, right? We really believe uh, that uh, the, we have to look at the world. We have faith in human creativity and ingenuity, right? And we also believe that us human beings cannot be locked up, okay? We crave freedom. I live on an island where everyone loves to travel, okay? Every three or four months, someone wants to leave Singapore, even though it's so great, right? And because of that, it is the freedom that we are craving. And the other thing is with this freedom is I look at these masks. I know people say it's necessary and all of that, but I look at us. God didn't create us to look like monkeys. Okay. And so I think we will sooner or later, we will fight this need to wear masks. Uh, even though today we all believe that we're not going to walk out of our door without, without that. Right. As, as human beings were meant to soar and to create a better life for ourselves, our families, and our countries. And as such, I think uh, that spirit, while it has been tamped down in the last few months, I think will awaken. And for some, it will be sooner rather than later. Okay. So the one, so let's now, having answered some of these questions and giving you some of our philosophy, let us look at what lessons are there. So we really believe the world has become more health conscious because this unknown, unseen virus came amongst us and infected millions and has killed thousands. So that as a big global thing, we have become more health conscious that we need to take care of ourselves, right? That's extremely important. And But there's also, that's like at a, at a big picture level. So at an individual level, I think we have learned that we must protect ourselves and as a result of that, we must become healthy and that requires us to change some habits, okay? Now, hopefully those habits will stick and not divert back. But we also become more vigilant about what we eat and drink, right? And one thing people have become aware of uh, is that processed foods that we have been eating for decades are really the cause of a lot of diseases taking place like diabetes uh, and cardiovascular diseases, et cetera, that are really, if you even notice about COVID, with uh, diabetes and cardiovascular diseases are more prone to death than other things. So this awareness has happened at an individual level to say that, hey, I need to be careful because if my immune system is stronger, then uh, I, will, I will fight off any diseases that come off. So I, I kind of like to say that the alarm has gone off in our head to become more aware. Uh, and to become more healthy. That health, health orientation is a mainstream idea, and I think it will stay. The application may be different, okay? So let us, let us talk a little bit about uh, uh, pure nectar. Uh, it, it is because the need for healthy products is there, we are very well uh, situated. Uh, so what does that mean? Uh, our products are uh, uh, really all health oriented, okay? These are juices uh, with fruits and vegetables uh, that are without any uh, preservatives, okay? Uh, we have a very large selection. There are about 70 plus juices available today, so they can be adapted to different countries. Uh, uh, in fact, we have just uh, released some products that are ideal for the Middle East and South Asia, um, you know, with cardamom and dates and other things and saffron. Uh, and, but all our products are no preservatives, no additives and no added sugar, okay? Uh, and you can, and it's hard, kind of hard to see, but you can see some of the products that we have. They're very, we focus on two things. The products have to be healthy and they have to taste great, okay? So what is, what is this business model? And I think uh, there, there are some very good points that she made. As, as she was talking, I was paying attention to say, did we do these things uh, with our business? As I said earlier, our business model was, a wholesale part where we had a distribution points where other people were selling our products, and then a retail part uh, that was where people ordered online and we delivered to them. That was the, the, the two things, but it required 
that a, a, a juicery is open in every city uh, and with it became all the expenses that are there. And so we said, how can we adapt and make this where you get to that rather than start with that, all right? So we, our, our new model that we have adapted to is that someone starts with a small juicery and see, this is counterintuitive to what everyone has been saying so far, right? About online and all that. And here we have gone to saying that our franchisees will open two juice bars because we don't believe this COVID thing is gonna last forever, okay? And so because of that, we require socialization. So instead of going to a coffee place or a restaurant, you come to a juice bar, and we also then create, we have created some unique products that are only available at a juice bar. It is a place where people can sit down, enjoy our juices with friends, uh, socialize for a while, and then they can leave. The online component still remains, right? Because customers can still order online, uh, but they also get to now come in to a juice bar. So the juice bar is also providing revenue. Now a franchisee may say, that's enough for me. I don't need to do any more. Or the franchisee can say that, hey, I want to grow at my own pace. I have goals and I want to grow at my own pace. And so now they can open additional juice bar, okay? Or they can open something we call juice station, which is also a pick up and go type of concept, <clears throat> maybe like a kiosk. Okay, you can see the picture on the left side. Then people will come up and they will just buy and they take away the product, right? So again, for different entrepreneurs, different solutions have been created, right? That, so we have the online, we have the juice bars for socialization, we also have juice stations for pickup and delivery, okay? This is a very profitable business and it is also very scalable. And so as a business model, we have to create that scalability so that people can, uh, can scale and grow at the pace that they want to. That's very important. So in essence, you're talking about to open one juice bar, uh, uh, to open the juicery, which is where the magic happens. That's where we make the juices and the first juice bar. Uh, and then you open a second one as your first one is starting to grow. That's the only commitment a franchisee is making. And that will run roughly around 200, thousand plus, okay? And a lot of it is based on local costs, okay? So I don't want to dwell too much on the numbers because this includes renovations and other things. But the idea is that I can open a juicery and then I can leverage the juicery with additional juice bars that will only make my business stronger and better, okay? Because as at the end of the day, when you are making something, the more volume you have, the costs go down, okay? Now, what we want to do is that the products that we have are relevant in today's post-COVID environment, okay? And what are we talking about? We're talking about products that are simple as just pure coconut, and we are talking about a line of cold-pressed juices. We have blends, we have juices with yogurt, we have juices with cold brew green tea. We have the largest selection of cashew nut milk products in the world. Uh, today we have 12 products made out of cashew nut milk because a large population cannot drink dairy milk, okay? But I would say to you, if you try our cashew nut milk product, it doesn't need to be that you're lactose intolerant or not. These are just delicious products that you will enjoy, okay? And we also have juice cleanses because a lot of people are aware that, hey, I need to just detoxify my body because that is the cause of disease. So our product range is quite wide and it can be adapted to the local market really well. As I was giving you the example, you know, a, a cardamom-based uh, juices may not do so well in Singapore or Malaysia, but they will do extremely well in the Middle East, South Asia, okay? So just, just as an example of how we have created a very large product line. But we are also a multi-channel sales business, and I think that's the important takeaway, is the relevance of different uh, countries that to have this retail locations, to have the online presence, to have distribution points where other third party people are carrying our products, as well as to forge relationships with food delivery and online delivery businesses, right, to deliver our products is extremely important. It's really about making it convenient to the customer to get the products when they want it. This is not a new theory. That concept of making it convenient to the customer has always been there in business, but I think businesses forgot that. 
and became so focused on one or two things. And I think really it is going back to the basics of saying that we need to make our product available everywhere. My, my grandfather, uh, when I was young, used to say this all the time and I learned from him. He said, you know, in business, we have to keep all the doors open for customers to come in. So whatever makes it easy for the customer, keep the doors open. And then the second part, he said, also keep all the doors open to take money, okay? Because when customers come in to buy your product, they also need to pay. So how you collect money from them also has to be open. And so I kind of that stuck with me over the years. And so with that, our business model really, you know, has, uh, has the opportunity to be a multi-channel for let's keep all the doors open and also, uh, you know, have multiple products that people can, uh, can get. Uh, if you are interested, of course, uh, in our brand, I would suggest that you just type in on your URL, purenectarjuice.com. Do, do not put in uh, uh, www. You can also I have a QR code. You can just scan it right now. Uh, it will take you to our website. And there you will see uh, number two here. It says there's franchising tab. If you click on that, it will take you to steps in bringing pure nectar to your city. And then there is on number three, is where it says confidential profile. If you complete that, it will take you 10 minutes. Please don't just put in your name and address and phone number. Do provide the details, okay? And it will only take you about 10 minutes or so, but then we know that we can engage with you to get detailed questions answered that we may not be able uh, to get answered today, okay? Uh, so we look forward to, I hope uh, what I was saying with my experience with Pure Nectar was relevant. Uh, and I, I hope that uh, you will engage with us to bring Pure Nectar to your uh, country, your city, because the product is extremely healthy and relevant, uh, and our business model allows you to scale uh, to fit today's environment. So thank you so much. My email and uh, contact information is also on the screen. With that, I will stop my sharing and... Uh, Turn it over to Troy. Thank you very much, uh, Harish, for that uh, that great introduction and some of the wisdom from from your grandfather, which I'll remember. And uh, looking forward to trying pure nectar the next time I'm in uh, in Singapore again. And thank you, Fiji, for the uh, for your wisdom and for for the introduction to what you've done with those those brands that you've uh, that you've become a shareholder in and. Uh, and uh, how you've uh, modified and evolved those brands to deal with the the, the relevance of the current uh, current marketplace. Um, we've got uh, we've got a handful of questions. Uh, I'm uh, maybe I'll direct it to you, Fee. Um, and the question is is basically what is the what is the gro growth potential of Asian brands in the Middle East? Fee, if you can unmute and answer that question for us, it would be great. I think um, uh, our cultures are very, very uh, similar. So um, over the years, I have seen uh, uh, not only in Vietnam, but also the neighboring countries, Asia, um, our regional brands are actually doing very well. Um, uh, number one is because um, all the big brands are actually um, entering markets, but the cost of operations um, and, the, and the investment is really high. Um, secondly, the regional brands are quite, because they are young and upcoming, they are quite flexible with their approach. So um, it's easier to, um, to deal with each other and to, to co-create um, possible solutions for each market. Um, and number three, I think uh, this is the, the Asian century. Um, this is when, um, you know, Asia is growing probably the most. Um, technological wise, um, uh, all the VCs, venture capitalists are actually moving to Asia to look for uh, new startups, new entrepreneurs to actually invest in because um, the world is now uh, turning to a new era, the creative economy. So with all of those, um, I am very sure that uh, you will find very flexible, adaptable, um, digitally enabled uh, franchise models from Asia um, that would be able to be very relevant to you um, in the Middle East. 
Uh, great fee. Thank you. Um, Harish, a question for you, um, which is uh, related to the, to the previous question is what, um, what types of franchises do you think would, uh, would be ideal for people to invest in post COVID? Um, in other words, uh, uh, if I'm an investor from the Middle East or or anywhere in the world, what would be the best types of franchises to look at as we as we emerge from this pandemic? I think it's a it's a great question. And uh, first and foremost, I think anything today that is in the health sphere, whether it is healthy eating products or whether it is uh, supplements or anything in the health oriented space, I think is going to be there for sure, right? Because people are really hyper aware uh, of this. But I think uh, beyond that, I think people need to also look at the approach of those brands, right? That uh, in the post COVID world, if, you, if that brand is only selling one way, it is going to suffer. And whether the suffering is uh, long-term or short-term, we don't know. But at least I think the ability that the products are being sold in multiple uh, ways, I think, is going to be relevant. Uh, I think uh, over 30 years, at least in franchising, I would say that any children-oriented stuff has always done well. Uh, however, children-oriented businesses that have not adapted to technology and are not able to offer online stuff, I think, are, are not the right solution. However, those companies that have, have an online solution with it, uh, then I think those will be relevant as well. Thank you, Harsh. We, we've got a couple of questions which are, again, related. Um, and I'll read them both and then, then I'll take, uh, I'll answer this. Um, what would be wiser decision as an Asian franchisor to do post-COVID, expand locally or regionally or consider international markets? And then, uh, and then moving on to the next portion, um, considering the large workforce of Asian expats in the Gulf countries, what advice would you give a Filipino brand looking to operate in the country like the UAE or, the, or, or KSA, which is the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia? Uh, you think there's good chances? So, so I'll answer the question in the, in the two parts that it was asked. Um, I think that that when you expand as a brand, you do look at your neighboring countries for for logistical reasons and because particularly in Southeast Asia, to fly from one capital to another uh, from all the Southeast Asian countries is never going to be more than four hours, and in most cases is a couple of hours, and there's a lot of cross-border travel, and um, and the cultures are very different, um, but but there is a demand for, for products from one Southeast Asian country and another. Um, but but we're also finding that, that as the, as the person asking the question has mentioned that the number of of Asian citizens living and working in places like Saudi and and the UAE and Qatar and Kuwait is very significant and uh, and that they long for for food from their own country and uh, and brand and they recognize brands from their own country and uh, and so I think that 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 does present an opportunity Having said that, we've had the the honor to work with with one of the largest Asian brands, in fact, the largest, which is Jolly Bee, and Jolly Bee doesn't enter markets. Um, they do look at markets where they have their the strong Filipino population, but but that is not a a long term strategy. So you have to plant your flag and look at the Filipino population. In the case of Jolly Bee, or the local population, but you also have to have a market entry strategy that wins over wins over uh, the broader population uh, because uh, F&B particularly is not a niche, uh, typically not a niche franchise model. So great opportunities for, for Asian brands in the Middle East uh, because of the, the large population of, of expats, uh, but, but also because of, of some of the things Fee mentioned earlier and Harish mentioned about adaptability and, and uh, similarities and, and so on. There's a question about supply chain and uh, how franchisors and franchisees acted um, to manage and deal with supply chain um, during uh, during the COVID uh, crisis. Want to take a stab at that one, Fee? 
I think supply chain is uh, maybe Harry start first because his supply chain is super uh, super difficult. Uh, but, but my models are pretty simple, so we, I don't have a lot of headache with it. <laughs> Thoughts, Harish? All our, all our all our fruit and vegetables are locally sourced. Uh, so during COVID, the probably the first uh, I would say month or so uh, in Singapore and Brunei. In Manila, we didn't face that issue. But in Singapore and Brunei, because everything comes from outside, uh, there was just a little tighter supply. Uh, but uh, I, because it's essential products, whatever we use in our juices is something we consume at home. Uh, there was a uh, big diligence to make sure that uh, uh, that stabilized. And so we, we didn't actually uh, face much issues with getting products. Okay, I, I think that uh, I'll add to that by by pointing out that in my presentation I used the word glocalization, and uh, and there's no doubt that a brand that was heavily dependent on importing products might have faced or, or would have faced greater challenges, and and so the learning is that that where you can decrease dependency on imports without compromising your quality standards. Um, and your uh, and and the, and the brand value that you deliver you deliver to your customers, you certainly should look at that. Um, and if not localizing supply, then then at least regionalizing supply. Um, you know, you can imagine a ship takes takes more than a month to get from the southern hemisphere to the northern hemisphere, and many weeks across the Pacific. And uh, and with uh, with transport challenges due to the virus, it's uh, those those time frames have probably tripled in some cases or or quadrupled. So, it is a it is an issue that people are going to have to to think more carefully about moving forward. We've got a couple of questions um, that were directed at Vietnam specific questions fee that Mary has uh, forwarded to your uh, LinkedIn page. And there's another question about can we get a list of franchises available in the email? I think that's something we can uh, we can share a list of the brands separately with uh, with the participants of the uh, of the webinar uh, through uh, through Index and the franchise talk team. So on that note, I think we've we've come to the end of the questions. Uh, I would like to thank everyone who who uh, joined us. Uh, we appreciate you joining us. We're sorry we ran over. We're all a bit long winded. Um, uh, we also want to uh, to thank uh, Index and the Franchise Talk uh, for their uh, for having us. Just a couple of uh, housekeeping issues. The next webinar is going to be on the 13th of October. That's a Tuesday. Uh, the Franchise Talk team will will send you the the details if you're a part of their, uh, if you're registered to receive their communications. And also let me remind you of the Global Franchise Market uh, Franchise Expo taking place in Dubai at the Dubai World Trade Center on the 9th and 10th of March, 2021. Uh, I'm planning to be there. Like I said, I'm an optimist. The glasses is going to be full by then and I look forward to uh, seeing all of you there at the Global Franchise Market in, in Dubai next year. Thank you again, Harish, um, for your time. Thank you again, Fee. Wishing you all a great, Thanks. great afternoon or evening. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Thank you. Bye.